Good evening, and welcome to our study tonight. Tonight, we're going to continue in Isaiah, getting towards the end of it. We're in Isaiah chapter 64. I titled our, our study tonight, uh, Our God, Our Strength. Amazingly, we, as we approach the last couple of chapters of Isaiah, we'll be approaching one full year, believe it or not, that we have, we have been studying this amazing book. When I started this study, I gave some facts about the book of Isaiah. And before we explore chapter 54 tonight, I want to refresh your memory and give you some more facts on this powerful book. So as we continue on, let's just talk about some of the things that we've already studied. The prophet himself, who was he? Well, he was born in about 760 to 755 BC. His name means Yahweh saves, or salvation is of Yahweh. Thirteen times in scripture, he's referred to as the son of Amos. And you can see those seven times in Isaiah, three times each in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And Jewish tradition suggests that Amos was the brother of Amaziah, the king. So Isaiah was a member of the royal family, as we've talked about over and over again. One of the reasons why he had such a long ministry is because he was royalty. They couldn't, they couldn't really do a whole lot to him. He was married, we know that, in chapter 8, verse 3, and had at least two sons. A Jewish tradition was sawn asunder in a hollow log by King Manasseh. So very, very uh, later in his ministry, obviously a king came and did do something that wasn't been able to be done before to him and killed him. Uh, it goes on, Isaiah probably prophesied from about 739 to 680 BC, a very long prophecy. During the reigns of King Uzziah, King Jotham, and King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah, who ultimately was the one who killed him. Uh, at this time, Assyria was the prominent world power, and around 709 BC, she brought to an end the northern kingdom them, the ten nations in the north that had their capital in Samaria, uh, as Samaria, in Samaria, which would have been witnessed by Isaiah, albeit he was a prophet to Judah. Even though they captured that, he was not touched by that because he was a prophet to Judah. The two tribes in Judah were Benjamin and uh, Judah, and the capital there was Jerusalem. So he wasn't touched by the northern kingdom being taken away from to Babylon, but again, he knew things were coming. And one of the reasons I'm telling you all this is because all of his book is centering around this with extended prophecies. Also, he was a contemporary with the prophets Hosea, a prophet to Israel, and Micah, which is a fellow prophet to Judah. So whenever you read Isaiah and you read Micah, they're talking about pretty much the same events. As we continue on, uh, we know that some grand themes came from Isaiah. Uh, the coming in of the Gentiles, uh, the Messiah, and his kingdom. Those are the things that he was really concentrating on. And Isaiah is like a miniature Bible, as we've told you before. 66 chapters, just like your Bible, with two interconnected yet distinctive sections. Chapter 30, 39 chapters and 27, chapter, 27 chapters. That's not a coincidence, even though we have that word up there, because that's exactly how your Bible is broken up from the Old Testament to the New Testament. First 39 chapters, a particular focus on sin and judgment. And you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be too uh, amiss to think that that's the same theme that's in the first uh, 39 chapters of your Bible. The last 27 chapters, which would be indicative of or parallel to the New Testament, would be a particular focus on the hope of redemption, just like the New Testament is. Romans 11.22 says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. We've been talking about that, about the righteousness of God and the judgment of God. On them which fell, severity, but towards thee, us, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. Very specific in the Bible, very black and white. Either you're for God or you're against God. It goes on. And uh, overall, there's 165 quotations, allusions, or possible allusions of the Old Testament total. Next, 18% of the Old Testament total. It's the next highest in the Psalms with 147. This is in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, we have 165 quotations from Isaiah. It's a very powerful book. Within this, 62 are direct quotations, is second only to Psalm. That's direct quotations in the New Testament with 82, but significantly higher than any other prophet, Jeremiah being the next with just 12. This book was therefore a critical source of, for New Testament writers. And so you can't really read the New Testament with that. If you didn't have an Isaiah, a good bit of the New Testament quotes would be gone. When they thought that through the Spirit expounded God's truth. It's a, it's a line that continues the Old Testament to the New. 1 Peter 1.10 says, of which salvation, Isaiah, remember, Yahweh saves, or salvation is of Yahweh. The prophets have inquired and searched diligently, and that he's talking about Isaiah, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I had someone write this week, this, uh, I guess it was the last couple of weeks, that Christ wasn't mentioned in the last chapter in Isaiah. Um, actually, you're extremely wrong. You're dead wrong. Uh, the whole book of Isaiah is a messianic prophecy along with the reality of what's happening right then and there. So you, you'd be hard-pressed not to find Jesus in every chapter of Isaiah. Let's go on. 
So Isaiah, or Isaias, is the Greek form of his name, in New Testament written in Greek, is named 13 times in the Gospel records. Jeremiah, only twice. He's named uh, there. Servant songs in chapter 42, 49, 50, 52, and 53. It's been called the Gospel according to Isaiah. So yes, Christ is there. The Gospel is presented in Isaiah. As you'll see tonight, we're going to have one verse that's going to tell us something that's going to really hit about the Gospel. Let me give you a little, little bit more. Some of the other facts about this book, it's based on the number of words, is the fifth largest book in the Bible and the third largest prophecy. Connections with Isaiah's name are embedded in a number of times in the book, and you can see the verses that are there. Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Again, one of the books that tells us about salvation over and over again. It's notable that 19 copies of the book of Isaiah were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've been there to, ca to the cave where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. We have found one book of Isaiah in complete, complete every single word of Isaiah that you have in your Bibles. Predates a thousand years that we knew before. So we understand that the book of Isaiah is extremely accurate. You have it just like they had it in the Old Testament. The most iconic being of these being the Great Isaiah Scroll. And that one is on display right now in the Hebrew universe. Well, actually, it's in the shrine of the book uh, in Jerusalem. You could actually see it and walk around it. Let me give you a little bit more as we go on. So, high level, the seven sections of Isaiah. Prophecies against Judah, we've already studied that, chapters 1 to 12. Prophecies against our, their neighbors, 13 to 23. Remember the woes that came down to them. Further prophecies against Judah, chapters 24 to 35. The historical record of Isaiah, or excuse me, Hezekiah, chapter 36 to 39. That's a pivot point in his book. And then the omnipotence of God, chapters 40 to 48. The prophecies of Messiah, 49 to 59. And then uh, prophecies of future glory, again with Messiah, Messiah being included in it, which is chapter 60 to 66, which we're in tonight. So, final treasure passages for comfort. 32.1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Obviously about the millennial reign of Christ. 32.17, The work of the righteous shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. That's again about the thousand-year reign of Christ. 35.1, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice, and blossom as the rose. Now that, that became... That became a uh, prophecy fulfilled partly when Israel became a nation and settled the, the, uh, the northern kingdom, with northern part of Israel, which was swampland. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon, northern part uh, to, to, to the north of, uh, of Israel, shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, which are now in Israel, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. 40.31 but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These are passages for comfort. 65, 17. For behold, I create new heaven and a new earth. All you have to do is go to 1 Peter to see that because he says the exact same thing. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. That's what's coming for us. And that's actually, actually beyond the thousand year millennium when God sets up his kingdom. But you shall be glad and rejoice forever that in which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a, a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and a joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no, be, no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Again, very strong prophecies. So as we see these, chapter 63 to 66 are what is referred to as the glorious finale of Isaiah's book, which is what we're in right now. Tonight we explore chapter 64. This is what we've seen in the last couple chapters. The glorious finale. Uh, chapter 62 was God singing to his church, as you remember we studied a couple weeks ago. And last week, chapter 63, the day of vengeance. And tonight will be God help us. And so that's what we're concentrating on tonight. Uh, I titled it, God helped us for a reason. A quick, a quick um, review of the previous two chapters tells us that, that as, a, <clears throat> as the chart shows, that chapter 62 was about a song that the Lord sang for Israel and by extension to us today, his church. The Jews started to return to Jerusalem. We've been telling you the history just in the, some of those chapters and some of those charts. In 537 BC, 70 years after their captivity, they came in waves, Ezra first, then Nehemiah, leading thousands upon thousands back to Jerusalem as Cyrus gave the decree to go back. This will show you the, how the exiles were led by Ezra and depart from Babylon. Nehemiah was also someone that took them. So we know that those are the routes they took <clears throat> to come back 
to Jerusalem, which had been sacked 70 years before by the Babylonians. So Isaiah is prophesying of the return in these last several chapters. And in so doing, he's also extending the prophecy to when all of the saved mankind will be re released from the curse of sin and this world, and when all mankind will worship Jesus in the thousand-year millennium, when Jesus rules on earth uh, in, the, in the rebuild Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, the third temple, if you will. So again, I'm kind of giving you a summation, and it's really putting Isaiah into perspective. He's talking about the Jews returning and Jerusalem being built up, and he's talking about us, by extension, uh, finally going, to, going in the thousand-year millennium and being able to be under the rule of Jesus when Jerusalem will really be a showpiece to the planet. So he's talking about uh, that third temple, if you will, not just the temple that Ezra and Nehemiah are going to build, rebuild, because that's what they're going to do, but also the third temple that's coming. Uh, that's an interesting picture. This is about the third temple being built in, in Israel. And you can see that this is from the, of an Israeli society that believes in the third temple coming. So we know that's there. But back in Isaiah's day, excuse me, back in, in uh, Ezra's day, the returning Jews were demoralized by what they saw as they approached Jerusalem. Uh, even though they were liberated from captivity uh, by Cyrus the Great, the magnificent temple and the gates and the walls of the city had been destroyed 70 years earlier, and they lie in ruins. And they were not prepared to see that. It was demoralizing to them. It's from here, Isaiah tells us in chapter 62, which we've studied, that in an effort, obviously, to uplift the, demol the, the uh, downtrodden Jews, God sings about his ability uh, to, to uh, be counted on for his work, for what his prophets said about him, for his promises or his oaths, and for his command to rebuild. So they, he was singing to them to encourage them. And he was singing that no matter how impossible it looked or how defeated they felt, that he was there to do it. It was our outline for chapter 62. God sings promises to his church. God is accountable for his word, accountable for his prophets, accountable for his oath, and he's accountable for his command. Then in chapter 63, as we continue to review that we studied last week, we saw Isaiah petition God in intercessory prayer for the undeserving uh, for God's help because he knew of their past rebellion and their sin. He knew that they were not deserving of God to do anything for them. He reminds us that God is our warrior king. He does that in chapter 63. And he has given us, all of us, who are sinners, because we all are, his mercy. And finally, warning us of the, of the penance for sin. Again, our outline for chapter 63 was this. The day of vengeance, cause of the warrior, the memories of mercy, and the penance for sin. In so doing, as we studied last week, we come face to face with two sides of the same coin. And if you studied this with us last week, then you remember these charts. Salvation and judgment. It's exactly what Isaiah has been talking about in all of his book. We told you 39 chapters talks about judgment. The last 27, the last 27 talk about his salvation, salvation. So again, like a Bible or your Bible, it's outlined the same way. So these are the themes that Isaiah has been giving us. Centered around the captivity of Israel. You should really be understanding all of this right now. It should all be coming together. Centered around the captivity of Israel for their sin and then re re coming back to rebuild Jerusalem and then extended to the captivity that you and I are in. And believe me, we're in captivity. We are in a kingdom that's not of God's right now. Yes, there's a kingdom of God, but it's in us. The Bible says that, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. But one day, it's our glorious hope, one day we'll be in God's kingdom, ruled by God. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being ruled by man. I want to be ruled by God because at that day, there'll be peace, there'll be prosperity. There won't be any crying in Jerusalem. And that's what Isaiah is talking about. So, that's a theme of all of Isaiah. And how all of us have sinned, as Paul says, because none of us deserve it. Paul said, if you remember from last week, for all have sinned and fall short, that's the key there, of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Fall short of the mark. I showed you this picture of ancient archers, how they would arch that longbow and shoot into the sky and then hope the trajectory would come down onto their enemy. Many times what they would do is they have to keep readjusting. Well, we, would, we can never reach God's holiness by ourselves because we're all sinners. And that's exactly what... what uh, what Paul was telling us, a great analogy that he gave, and unfortunately, a lot of people today wouldn't know that, but everyone that read that when Paul wrote it would know exactly what he was talking about. Uh, concluding again what Paul so aptly reminds us of in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. It is the theme of your word. It is the theme of Scripture. It's the theme of God's dealing with man. Sin abounds on planet Earth, but there's much more grace 
than there is for sin. The gates of grace are still open. Anyone on the world can walk into those gates of grace. That is the gospel message. And now in chapter 64, after spelling out man's dual nature and the Lord's dual actions of, of salvation and punishment and of sin and grace, Isaiah's boldness takes a giant leap forward from the Father's love to the sovereign power when he appeals to God for a dramatic show of strength on behalf of his people. So our outline for tonight is this. Very simple. God our strength. It's an appeal for help and then a request for forgiveness. Isaiah knows his God and he knows his people. And tonight, in an effort to put uh, an easy, easy to follow storyline to this chapter, I will be quoting the verses from the Living Bible so that you can see it. The first part is an appeal for help. And here's what the Living Bible says in verses 1 through 7. Oh, that you would burst forth from the skies and come down. Isaiah speaking to God. How the mountains would quake in your presence. The consuming fire of your glory would burn down the forests and boil the ocean, oceans dry. The nations would tremble before you. I get chills just reading it. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. So it was before when you came down. For you did awesome things beyond our highest expectations. And how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no one has seen or heard of such a God as ours who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who cheerfully do good, who follow godly ways. It's a powerful set of scripture verses. Uh, look how Isaiah starts the appeal. Oh, that you would burst forth from the skies and come down. It's a pretty powerful word and a sentence in the Living Bible. But the uh, King James says it this way. It says, oh, that you would rend the heavens. That word rend means to rip in half or to split down the middle. And we who are living in an evil, ungodly world would do well to pray this verse out loud, that you would come down, God, that you would return, that you would show us the, the, what's happening and you would take control of everything. It's a call for a miraculous act to help in which, in which supernatural powers breaks through the natural world and defeats evil. Now, let me say a couple things before I get to that, to get to tell you how God's done it before. God is waiting and the only reason he's waiting is because of his great grace because God would have it that none should perish. So his doors of grace are open so that as many as can come in can come in. But you and I have said it over and over again, God, why don't you stop this? Why don't we just stop? If God could stop evil, why doesn't he? Well, because God has a wise understanding of his creation and he knows that once that door is closed, then his wrath must come on those who haven't accepted him. It's an awesome responsibility. None of us could stand in the place of God. When would you do that? I remember leaving my church, leaving Cathedral of the Cross. There was never a good time to leave. I always told pastors, you don't want to leave when anything's bad happening in your church. That's usually when pastors leave. You want to leave when it's, it was in good shape. And that's what I felt I did. I left when it was in good shape, but it was still difficult because I knew that there were some people last week that got saved in that church. And I knew it was very difficult for me. But when? When could you do it? It was a hard, hard decision for me of the timing. Imagine the timing of God saying that I'm now going to stop evil. That's a tough, tough a, st a statement to make, but God's going to do that one day. We know that. He has to do that. And this is what Isaiah's pleading for. Come now. Come on now, God. Come down now. Separate evil forever and put us into that place where you've given me prophecies for. It's a powerful prayer. Uh, he's trying to ask that of God. And of course, he's, it's a rhetorical question because he knows the answer. He knows it's not yet, but he's still asking it. And the events are all over the history of God's people interceding for, uh, for uh, some behalf and God actually answering them in a really miraculous worldwide way. Let me give you just a couple examples. First of all, in American Revolutionary War of 1776, it's estimated that there were 15 miraculous events that led to America defeating the British. And by the way, it was absolutely impossible for us to, to defeat them. They had the strongest, toughest, well-trained uh, army in the world. They had, they had owned the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. And for colonists who had never fought a war, a ragtag group of people to get together and try to even compete with the British was absolute suicide. And the signers of the Declaration of Independence knew it. They put everything up they had knowing that they could lose everything they had. And some of them did. But there was a, some interesting things. I'm going to just give you one of them. General George Washington uh, was, was commander of the Continental Army, and he was trapped. He led his army into Manhattan. And Manhattan, if you know anything about it, is surrounded by water. Well, the British had come and had surrounded Manhattan. And what they were going to do is they were going to wait one day. They knew they had them. It would have been the end of the war. The colonists would have become British subjects again, and they would never have been able to rise up again at that time. And so he, they knew they had him. He knew they had him. Uh, and it was his, one of his first battles. And as he was there, surrounded in Manhattan with 9,000 troops, the British said, we're not going to take them tonight. They're not going anywhere. We'll destroy them tomorrow, and this thing will be ended. 
And the British actually had parties on their boats. The generals were partying, and they knew it was over. Um, General George Washington sounded a retreat, much as it must have sounded absolutely insane to his people because there was no place to retreat to. The only thing they could do was go across the river, and there were battalions of British watching every port on that river. They were watching them. Uh, he actually went down, if you read the reports of the history, they actually went down, some of the troops went down to some place that we know, right where the Brooklyn Bridge is, and they were met with a garrison, by a garrison of British, and they turned around and came back up. Well, Washington regrouped, and he said this. He said, we're going to go over tonight, and I'm going to take us in a spot, and I'm going to ferry you over the river by boats. 9,000 men. They have to do it silently. There were sentries everywhere. It was almost impossible. They would, have been, they would have been massacred. But one of the thickest fogs that you could possibly, possibly imagine, some of the historians say, came in that night, came in at 10 o'clock. He was planning on doing it at 10 o'clock. As it came in, some of the historians say, you could not see your hand in front of your face. He ferried 9,000 men over the river and their horses and their equipment without losing one single man. As he ferried them over the river, at six o'clock they were done, and at six o'clock the fog raised. That's an act of God. By the way, he went from there to Trenton, New Jersey, where the Hessians were camped, 1,400 of them, and had the first defeat of the Continental Army. It gave such morale and a boost. I, again, I get chills because without God, that would not have happened. Now, what was happening in the meantime? Well, you had people praying. You had intercessors praying. You had them praying for, for this fledgling America to be, be able to stand up for their liberties. Let me give you another example. In, um, in World War II with Adolf Hitler, uh, we know that there was something that happened there. And by the way, here's the two pictures, some of the great pictures that were made about him ferrying across his people and one of them in the fog. Uh, and so it's pretty amazing because it's very well documented, even in art, that that's exactly what happened. In World War II, Adolf Hitler was expanding his, his world. He was conquering everything in Europe. And he was a real threat to mankind. Uh, England was the, was the sole bastion that was trying to, trying to go against him. And they were going to be decimated if America didn't get into the war. But before that, that's, that's, the, that's the Western Front. He was so bold that he decided to go to the Eastern Front also, which is where Russia was. Now, Russia, even though they were communistic, were our allies. We were, they, were the, uh, they were the allied powers, fighting the Axis powers. And Hitler puts together something that was never done before in the history of mankind. He put together 4.5 million troops while he's already fighting the Western Front. He put them in for the Eastern Front. His idea was it, was, it was called Operation Barbarossa. And his idea was to inundate Russia and go to Moscow and def 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 defeat Russia. By the way, had he been successful, you and I would, would probably be under the rule of the Reich tonight because it was so powerful. And he knew it. He knew it would change the whole war. So he put in the largest invasion force in human history, 600,000 vehicles, 650,000 horses. It was to last no more than three months, three months. Here's was the, here was the invasion plan, and you can see the enormity of it. You can see these are, this is an army on the move, 4.5 million ground troops. Imagine that, largest ever. So he sends it through Operation Barbarossa. It looked like it would actually succeed as Nazis took 3.3 million Russian prisoners, 3.3 million of the war in the first three months. They thought he sent them out, by the way, in the summer, thinking that they were going to, can, they were going to have it done in a couple months. And they, they starved the millions of Russians in their quest towards Moscow. They had a scorched earth policy. Every place they went, they totally destroyed. But then, by an act of God, the worst Soviet winter on record came after the wettest summer on record. The vehicles, those 600,000 vehicles, got swamped in the mud and they were unable to escape. For two months, they were, they were locked up. Then the winter set in and hundreds of thousands of Nazi soldiers dressed only in summer uniforms, no winter uniforms, froze to death and were turned back 50 miles outside of Moscow. It was the turning point of World War II. Of course, America was praying. Now, Russia may not have, but America was standing in the gap. That was a time when Americans prayed. It was a time when Americans interceded. And you can look the, at the history annals of how many people prayed uh, that God would end the war. They knew it was a force of evil against good. And they knew that that was ex exactly what it was. And that intercession brought that supernatural power down because the weather is an act of God. And God gave that weather. 
And Israel, let me just remind you of those, miracle after miracle, outnumbered 60 to 1 in most of their battles, surrounded by 22 aggressive Arab nations, instantly start fighting as soon as they declared themselves a nation in May of 1948. They're fight, they fought so far eight major wars since 1948, and they have never been defeated, and their losses are minimal compared to the ones that they've given. Back to Isaiah. By verse 5, Isaiah dares to call for the same power and the zeal that God the warrior used to destroy his enemies to be exercised for the salvation of his people. Look at verse 5 and what it says. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. Can you imagine? It's in the book of Isaiah. We need to be saved. Wow, look at those last words. You indeed are the one, but we need to be saved. I said it before and I'll say it again. Instead of kneeling down as some have done and asking for forgiveness from Black Lives Matter, which is an organization started by three women who are Marxist, who hijacked an ethnic group, we should be bowing down to Almighty God and asking Him for forgiveness as a nation. Because as a nation, we have sinned. Uh, need to be, and we need to be saved. Isaiah goes on, but we are not godly. We are constant sinners. Notice how he's sticking himself in there with the pronoun we and have been all our lives. Therefore, your wrath is heavy on us. How can such as we be saved? We've done so much. Think about America. Think about where we've come. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we put on our prized robes of righteousness, we find they're but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we fade, we wither and fall. And our sins, they're like the wind, and they sweep us away. Yet no one calls upon your name or pleads with you for mercy. Again, think about America. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. Isaiah confesses their sin as filthy rags, like fading autumn leaves, he says, that are driven by, by the wind and the wind controls. It's a great description of how sin stains us, how it withers us, how it dries us up, and how it blows away our, our, our chances to be blessed by God. It's interesting that Isaiah uses the pronoun we, as I said before. He so identifies with his people, like Jesus identified with us when he took our burdens. And here we see him truly as an intercessor, Isaiah. Because intercession is a way of loving others. That's exactly what it is. America truly needs intercessors today. Intercessory prayer might be defined as loving our neighbors on our knees. Intercession is truly universal work for the Christian. No place is closed to intercessory prayer. No continent, no nation, no organization, no city, and no office. There is no power on earth that can keep intercession out, Richard Halverson said. Listen, Isaiah continues, request for forgiveness. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. He says, we've all sinned. He said, but yet, and listen to, the, listen to the juxtaposition. He says, we've all sinned. We don't deserve anything, but God, you're our Father. Think about it. Think of the plead. We are the clay and you're the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Oh, be not angry, so angry with us, Lord, for, for, nor forever remember our sins. Oh, look and see that we are all your people. Even though we're sinners, we're your people. Your holy cities are destroyed. Jerusalem is desolate. Remember I told you leading up to this? That's what they've seen. It's a desolate wilderness. Our holy, beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned down. And all the things of beauty are destroyed. After all of this, must you still refuse to help us? Lord, will you stand silent and still punish us? So he's pleading. He's asking for forgiveness. Given the power of God and the sins of the people, Isaiah has no alternative but to throw himself on the mercies of God's court and ask for forgiveness for his nation, like Lot did for Sodom and like we should do for America. Let me stop myself right here. I think the reason America has had a great eco economy and lifestyle in our past and the reason we won major wars and survived the Great Depression was because of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of persons in that generation interceded for America. Let me repeat it. I think the reason we've had so much accomplishment is because we were a Christian nation. We were a nation that went to church. We were a nation that was praying. We, had, we have grandparents. Some of you have grandparents and great-grandparents that spent lots of times on their knees and they prayed for America. They interceded for their families. That's the reason why we won. It's not because of our great military progress. It's because of people really understanding what the great weapon of war is intercession. It's prayer. It's the weapon of mass destruction. I believe that with all my heart. I also believe as our nation has slid away from God in the last 40 or so years, think about it. There have not been raised up intercessors to stand in the gap. Coupled with the, with the far less people going to church or even being godly in America, our intercessor, intercessors are, are less and less and less. No one is standing 
few are standing in the gap. Consequently, our covering by God as a nation is getting the, to a point of non-existence. God had a covering. His hand was covering this nation because people were praying. And now that they're not, he's pulling his hand off the nation. Now your family should be covered if you're saved because you're trusting God. There's a covering there. And that's a, that's a solace to us, especially as we live in this nation. Once it happens, once God withdraws his hand of protection, and once it's pulled away, then Satan has full power to run in and devour. Our strength, look, our strength is not in the polling booth. Our strength is in the prayer closets of our homes, of the quiet times in our churches, and the uh, frequent moments of crying out to God for help. Isaiah, like a defense attorney in a final plea to the jury, acknowledges God as all-powerful, all-loving, and all-wise in relationship to his creation. Verse 8 says it. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and you are a potter, and we are the work of your hands. That is a verse of total submission. God, we're in your hands. You can mold us any way you want. And Isaiah is not the first nor the last to use the potter's analogy. We see it with, uh, in, with David. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Talking about his enemies. Or this one, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, Jeremiah chapter 18. Or the precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how, they are, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, clay, the work of the hands of the potter in Lamentations. It says this in Romans, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? If you know anything about pottery, once, that, once that, that piece of clay is started to pull up and that hand is put in it, the hand of, in this analogy, the hand of God, and shaped, if it's misshaped, the potter slams it back down and starts to rebuild it again. You can see it over and over again in Israel's history. As God would have to, because there was some flaw in them, he would have to slam them back down and rebuild them. And we see it even in Revelation. Uh, the Revelation tells us this. It says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Revelation 2.27. When we start to talk about Revelation, when we actually teach it in three weeks, you'll be, we'll be seeing that verse really kind of come to, come to, uh, uh, to fullness as we study it. And you may never have made the connection, but I did. When Judas Iscariot killed himself, he took the potter's profession. He took his own clay in his own hands. And, it, and by breaking himself, instead of, instead of in the potter, breaking him and remaking him as a potter does. Judas could have done what Peter did. They both denied Christ. Judas could have gone back to Jesus for forgiveness. But basically, he took his own life, that clay, and he made himself the, the potter. It's wrong to do that. And I hate the fact that some people actually condone suicide. Suicide is wrong in all, all sense of the way. I, I have sympathy with people who have done that. I understand that. But you become the potter when you do that. And that's not ours to give. Life and death is in the hands of God. So Judas is actually becoming his own potter. And you may have missed this. What did the Pharisees do with the 30 pieces of silver? Remember, Jesus, uh, Judas uh, said he did wrong, and he took the 30 pieces of silver, and he brought them back. What did they do with it? Watch. It says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he had condemned, repented himself, and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to, it, to that. And he cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It's not lawful for us to put it into the treasury because it's the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. That is not a coincidence that that's there. That's exactly what happened there. Back to Isaiah. From verse 10 through verse 11, Isaiah implores God to look and see what has happened to his chosen people. Your holy sitters are destroyed. Jerusalem's a desolate wilderness. Our holy, beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned down. And all the things of beauty are destroyed. We should be praying today. God, they've shut down our churches. We can't go, we can't go back into church. This is the exact same thing, by the way. Uh, we, it's, a, it's almost a place of desolation. No one there. And again, it was very difficult for people to, to go through that last year. In verse, having pulled out every emotional and rational stop, Isaiah can leave God only with the questions of this. After all of this, must you still refuse to help us, Lord? Will you stand silent and still punish us? Isaiah knows his God so well that he asks a rhetorical question, and that's what this is. He can count on God, and he knows that, to respond favorably to the plea of mercy. After all, what parent can deny their children? Remember, he started out, Father, we are yours. Or greater yet, what creator can fail his creation? Intercessors such as Isaiah have good reason to believe that God the Creator and God the Father will answer their prayers for forgiveness. Tonight, 
the application of Isaiah chapter 64 is startling for us. When we pray for America, it's not necessarily for the nation per se to turn around and toward God. That would be great, but that's not why you pray for America. When I say we in America have sinned, I'm talking about the nation. But when you intercede, I think we miss it. You can intercede for the nation called America, but that's really not where your intercession should go first. We should rather be for individual Americans. We should be interceding for our bosses, for our coworkers, for our family, for our friends, for our loved ones. America is, a, is on a collision course with end time events. A runaway debt load exceeding $30 trillion. A lack of solid biblical teaching and preaching in a lot of churches. A secular Marxist leaning government. A suppression of fundamental rights of its citizens. The outright animosity to anything and everything godly. And an, ex, and an establishment sexually, excuse me, and an entrenchment sexually to a new Sodom and a new Gomorrah. And we, like Isaiah, need to intercede for Americans first, for individuals that we know personally who are being caught up in the lie of politics, the lies of the media, the lies of less God and more religion. If we intercede now, a ground force and a groundswell, I believe, will rise up to meet the current tidal wave of spiritual aggression that we now see. So I appeal both to everyone listening to intercede, and I appeal to God, as Isaiah did, to extend his mercy to us yet again. And remember, this nation, this one nation, conceived under God with life, I believe that's spiritual life, and liberty, which means to speak out our convictions, and give it the mercy, not the justice it deserves. I intercede for forgiveness tonight, because a new world is coming, I promise you that, and it's coming soon. And time is short to call on him, and depend upon the one who created it all. So tonight, would you pray with me? Would you bow your heads just wherever you are? Hold hands with your spouse if they're there, or your kids, and let's pray together. Lord, I titled this chapter in Isaiah, God Our Strength. Isaiah knew it, and I know it. You are almighty, all-knowing, and all-present. Nothing happens in heaven or under heaven that, you're not, that you are not in control of, including all the rumblings that are going on, and the moral crevasse America is currently in. Lord, I intercede for Americans, for fellow ministers, for co-workers, for bosses, for friends, for family. Meet them, Lord, where they hurt. Forgive us and help us to forgive others. Heal us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight.